Welcome back, students. Now that we have an understanding of the levels of measurement and the properties our variables might take on, let's think about how we might want to display our variables as data. So, as an overview, we're going to talk about proportions and percentages, percentile ranks, cumulative percent frequency distribution tables, and other forms of distribution tables, and we'll look at some graphics, pie charts, bar charts, and histograms. Okay, so let's begin. To begin with, proportions and percentages are ways to standardize frequency distributions relative to the size of the distribution, rather than just reporting out the raw number of observations we have within any given category. And proportions and percentages are probably the two most popular methods of doing so. A proportion is the number of cases compared in a, in a given category compared to the total size of the distribution or the total number of observations. But most people prefer percentages to show relative size. And a percentage is just the frequency of observations we have over the number of cases times 100. Percentile ranks are another way to display data. And we can think of a percentile rank as the percentage of cases falling at or below a given score. So for example, if we had deciles, we would divide our distribution into 10 equal portions and from 0 to 10% of our observations would fall into our first category, 10 to 20% of our observations into our second category, 20 to 30 into our third category, etc., etc., etc. More common, however, is quartiles. Quartiles are the points that divide a distribution into equal quarters. So the first 25% from 0 to 25 are what's called the first quartile. And from 26 to 50 is the second quartile. And the next 25% of cases is our third quartile, and our last quartile is from 75 to 100. Now the interesting thing about quartiles is the location of the second quartile is also called the median, the point in the distribution where half your observations are above and half your observations are below. Let's think about how to summarize our, our data in frequency uh, tables. We're going to look at frequency distributions, relative frequency distributions, percent frequency distributions, and finally the cumulative percent frequency distribution table. These last two tables, the percent frequency distribution and the cumulative percent frequency distribution table, are going to be the ones that we actually use. In a frequency distribution, what we're showing is just a tabular summary of data with the frequency or number of items into each of our several non-overlapping categories. So in this table, we're looking at the frequency distribution for the approval of George W. Bush in his handling of the war in Iraq. And you can see that all we have is those who said approve strongly, we have 309 observations, approve not strongly, 190 observations, etc., to a total of 1,193 observations. Now, this is the genesis of what's called a relative frequency distribution. The relative frequency distribution uses the proportion formula and figures out what's called the relative frequency. So for example, for the 309 observations we have who are proved strongly, we divide that by the total number of observations and we get the relative frequency, which in this case is 0 0.259. Probably more commonly used, however, is a percent frequency distribution. And here we have it again for the approval of George W. Bush's handling of the war in Iraq. And the 309 observations we had, just like in our relative frequency distribution, is divided by 1190, but now it's multiplied by 100, and so we have 26% of our observations. Percent frequency distributions are the ideal way to show a nominal level variable. If we don't have a rank order to the categories, we would use a relative frequency distribution. If there is an order to the categories, as is the case with our variable here, where we're looking at the approval of George W. Bush, and we understand the order runs from approve strongly to disapprove strongly, we want to maintain the order. And when we maintain that order, we can develop what's called a cumulative percent frequency, which sums the percentages by category, incrementing upwards from the smallest value to the largest value, according to however we've coded it in our computer. This is actually one of the most informative tables that we can possibly create. We're going to use it widely. We can also use percent frequency distribution tables to show differences across different subsamples. So for example, I have uh, the gender of students majoring in engineering at College A versus College B. 
And it might be claimed by College A that they admit 270 students who are female into their engineering program and College B only admits 37. But you can see that when we convert them into percentages, 270 of 1352 is only 20% for College A. And for College B, 37 of 183 is also 20%. So neither college is more likely to admit females to their engineering program. Thus, the only claim that can be really be made by College A is that they have more students. Now, we also can use our tables for showing our ranges of interval level variables as well. And you can see here, we have the highest grade completed from one through more than 17 years of, of schooling completed. And you can see that we have the categories on the left-hand side, which in this case are the numerical values, the frequencies, the percent frequency, uh, the percent frequencies, the cumulative frequencies, etc. And you can see at various points by looking at the cumulative frequencies, the relative percentile ranks of the observations up to that point. So for example, 38.35% of our observations have 12 years of education or less. The problem with displaying a table as we've done here is the number of cases that we have or the number of different unique categories. Generally, as a rule of thumb, you should try to keep the number of categories in a univariate table under, at 10 or under. It'll make it easier for your audience to interpret your table. So while we might like to preserve the properties of our interval level data to do any later statistical analysis, for the purpose of displaying our data, we might like to reduce the number of categories. So for example, I can take the cumulative percent frequency distribution for the highest grade level the respondent completed. And in this case, I've taken all of the categories that went from 1 to 11 and called it a value of less than high school. And you can see that I have 142 observations who had less than high school education of 1,210 total observations. That's 11.74%. And you can see that I had 322 observations that had completed high school or had 12 years of formal school, schooling of, two, of 1,210 for another 26.61%, and combined, those two categories accumulate to 38.35%. I'm still making the same claim as the previous table, but now we're looking at a table that's much easier to read. We've converted our interval level variable to an ordinal level for the purpose of displaying it to our readers. There are a number of ways that we, we might want to display our data using graphics. Graphics are useful because we can emphasize certain aspects of the data, and many people are visual learners and prefer graphs to tables. There are different types of graphs, and they include pie charts, bar charts, frequency polygons, line charts, box plots, histograms, etc. Many different ways to display data. We're only going to focus on three of them for the moment. A pie chart is a circular chart whose pieces add up to 100%. This is especially good for nominal level data where there's no rank order between the data categories. And it's possible to highlight or explode certain pieces for emphasis if we want to focus on one particular category that's of interest to us. So when you think of why we use a pie chart for nominal level data, think to yourself about Arthurian legend. King Arthur and his knights of the round table sat at a round table because there was no rank order between the knights. They all were equally important. And that's why pie charts are round. All the slices are equally important. Bar charts and histograms are also terrific ways that we can display data and their distributions. They're amongst the most widely used graphics in social research, and we can use them with frequencies or percentages. And you can see on the left here, I have what's called a histogram. Histograms are useful to show continuity along a scale. They're excellent for interval and ratio level variables. Bars are good for discrete variables or variables that are, have distinct categories like ordinal variables. And you can see on the right, I have the highest level of education completed by the respondent. And you can see the categories less than high school, high school diploma, some college, bachelor's degree, and graduate school. What happens with both a histogram and with a bar chart is you increment upwards as you go from the lowest category to the highest category. The difference between the two is that the bars touch in a histogram for when we have interval and ratio level data because we understand the distances and the bars do not touch in a bar chart because we don't know the distance between possibly less than high school, high school diploma, and some college. 
All right, that's it. Terrific. So we've looked at proportions of percentages. We've considered the impact of percentile ranks. We've looked at cumulative percent frequency distributions and other distribution tables. And we looked at a variety of ways we could show our, our variable graphically. Great job. We'll see you soon. You're well on your way to becoming social research analyst students. Our next video is going to focus on central tendency or central location. We'll see you soon.